When it comes to heating and cooling, there is one piece of equipment that really grabs our attention, the heat pump. There's a lot to love about heat pumps. They're able to find and move heat in and out of the building. In the summer, warmth is pulled from the house and dumped outside. In the winter, even if it's as cold as zero degrees out, warmth is scavenged from the outdoors and dumped into the building. All you need is enough electricity to run the compressors and some fan motors. There are different types of heat pumps for different types of houses. To understand how the technology works, it can really be broken into two parts. The source side, which is where the heat is being gathered from, and the load side, which is where the heat is being delivered to the building. And there are really four different categories of heat pumps. There are water to water, water to air, air to air, and air to water. We've talked about this technology a lot. Today, I'm gonna to do a deep dive on each category of heat pump to see how they work and to see how newer ones can be used in the future house. The first two types of heat pumps are both water sourced, which means they typically require geothermal drilling. Now, before I get into geothermal, it's worth mentioning that heat moves from a hotter fluid to a colder fluid. And the difference in temperature is called delta T, but heat always moves from hot to cold. There's a lot to love about geothermal heat pumps. The temperature below our feet is consistent year round. And when we tap into that, the heat pumps don't have to work as hard to deliver comfort to the building. On the other hand, geothermal drilling can be very expensive. Some of these systems start off at $20,000 and move their way up from there. The other thing to keep in mind with geothermal is that those systems can deliver about 120 degrees, unlike a boiler, which can deliver 180 degrees. And so in a retrofit application, you might need supplemental heat to bridge the gap, but it's still a great option to consider. Now, this is an example of a water to water heat pump. On this side, you have the source side. This is where the piping comes to and from the geothermal field. And on this side, you have the load side. This is the piping going to and from the building. This operates very similar to a forced hot water system, whether it's radiant floor heat, radiators, baseboard, or anything similar to that. Now, this is an example of a water to air heat pump. As you can see, you have the same geothermal piping going to and from on the source side. But on the load side, you have ductwork leaving the unit. And that ductwork is delivering heating and cooling to the building, very similar to a forced air system. For air to air heat pumps, who better to talk to than my dad? Hey, Ross. How's it going? I'm doing fine. You know, when I think about air to air heat pumps, it's what everybody knows, right? It's that box outside that makes all the noise. It's the standard air conditioner. Covering leaves. Except, except the heat pump is supposed to reverse and actually bring heat from outside to inside. Yeah. Now, when they first came into this game, they were great, except they didn't work when it got to be 35 <laughs> degrees outside. So in my past, 35 degrees come, all of a sudden you have to put electric heaters in, the meter spun, heat pumps became like a, a really a, a non-story here, and at least in the cold climates. Sure. And then, 25, 30 years ago, from Asia, these inverter heat pumps came air to air. So air on the outside blows across the, the outside unit, yep. it picks up the heat even on the coldest day and could heat the whole building Okay, and now what happens is it would come in and go into the conventional furnace, but this inverted technology invited the thing called the mini split. Single box outside, the high side wall inside the unit, uh, then the single box outside could also have multiple connections on the inside, and you could have the high side wall units, but also connect into your ductwork. Right. The thing is, these things are the rage now. Everybody wants them. They're relatively low first cost, they're quiet, they're efficient. Yep. Uh, but we find that people don't really necessarily say, I want to make sure I can get one of these mini splits on right. my wall, right? right? Yeah. So we're seeing a trend where they'll use the mini splits, but they'll also try to connect it to ductwork. Sure. But that's this is really the future. How are we going to move heat from outside to in or from inside to out? All right. I appreciate the history right. lesson. Right. Thank I'll you. I'll be here doing emails. Now, most of the heat pumps that we've seen up until this point have not been all that surprising. In fact, they're already common in homes today, and we've covered them quite a bit on the show. But there's one technology that we haven't talked about, and that's the air to water heat pump. Hey, John. Hi, Ross. How's it going? Good. So you're an engineer and an expert in hydronics. That's right, and we're using hydronics in this house. We're installing an air to water heat pump. Okay. Takes heat out of the outside air in the winter, even when it's really cold, puts it into water. That water can go inside the house, heat the house, and provide domestic hot water. Okay. And then in the summer, it can provide chill water for cooling the house. Wow, so heating, cooling, and domestic hot water. All three from one system. I like that. Can we take a look? Yeah, let's go. All right. So Ross, this house was originally heated with propane, and this is the original air conditioning system uh, for cooling the house, but this is going away. Okay. 
and this is the outdoor unit of the heat pump. This is the air to water heat pump. This is the outdoor portion of the air to water heat pump. So I've noticed the unit's raised up. That's right, we're in upstate New York where we get a lot of snow, so we wanna make sure this unit stays above the snow because it is gonna operate all winter long. Okay. And in winter time, cold air, even, even air below zero can go through this coil. There's a fan that draws it through and we can actually extract heat out of that really cold air. It goes into refrigerant and then the refrigerant transfers heat to the water at this heat exchanger. And you'll see in the back here, we've got piping that goes into the house. So the pipe is a little bit bigger than what I'm used to. It is because this piping is carrying water rather than refrigerant. I see, that's the air to water part. It is. Okay. And uh, the size, it looks a little bit bigger than what I'm used to seeing with a ductless mini split or something like that. Sure, this is larger because this is doing the entire house. Okay, heating, cooling, and domestic hot All water. three from this one unit. Okay, can I see where the pipes go? Sure, let's go downstairs. All right. So Ross, the outdoor unit we just looked at is right outside this window, and up above me here is the piping that brings the warm water in in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. And if we follow that piping along, we come over to the indoor unit, and Ben's just finishing up some of the last details on the system. So we'll pop the cover here. Pop you out there. And Thanks, this is actually a pre-assembled uh, plug-and-play assembly. This, this is the brain of the system. This is what decides where the heat from the heat pump goes. Yep. Um, it can go to the domestic hot water tank over here behind us. Yep. And one of the unique things this system has that other systems don't have, we see the manifold station up on the wall. This lets us expand to panel radiators and radiant floor circuits in nice. the future. This is something that a ductless mini split system can't do. Mm. The other thing that this box can do for space heating is it's gonna send warm water through this piping over to this air handler. And this whole area is where the existing propane furnace was. And what Ben has done is he's cut the ductwork up above here, so we're reusing the existing ductwork in the system. Got it. To save costs there. And then we have a return air that comes down just like with a standard furnace, and it goes through this air handler. And inside this air handler, we've got the warm water that goes through a coil, and the return air goes through that. And inside here, we have a blower, just like in a furnace. Mm -hmm. It blows that air back up through the dusting, and it goes out through the house just like it would with a furnace system. Right. And the process just repeats in cooling, just with chill water. Correct. We have chill water going through here. It goes through the coil, and that will dehumidify and cool the air down, and then the blower will distribute that nice, comfortable air through the house. Yeah, and back to the indoor unit. I mean, I see an expansion tank, I see a pump, I see a flow center. I mean, these are just normal components I would see in a geothermal system with hydronics. So it's, it's nice that they have it all pre-packaged, plug is. and play. That's one of the unique things they've done is to save the installer's time. They have pre-assembled and pre-engineered these components. So this box goes on the wall and this can save hours of installation time on a, on a site. All right, so what's left for the install? Well, what Ben is doing over here with the flush cart, he's adding a mixture of water and a, and a non-toxic antifreeze to the system because we are in a cold climate. We wanna protect that piping outside against freezing. Sure. And Ben's got a few more things to do here. We've got some wiring that he's gonna be doing to wire up the indoor unit, the air handler, the circulator. And after that, it's ready to turn the switch on and off we go. All right, that sounds great. Yeah. Well, John, that really feels like the best of both worlds. You don't get the site disruption and the upfront cost with geothermal drilling, but you also get the advantages and efficiency with hydronics inside the building. That's right. It's one type of heat pump that fits a certain niche in the market. It's really good for a retrofit strategy when you've got an existing house that's running on propane or oil and you're trying to get over to a renewably sourced electricity. It's also really good new construction with radiant. Yeah, absolutely. Now, what about economics? Well, this house originally was uh, heated by propane and the, the supplier was a sole supplier, so it was fairly expensive, it was costing the homeowner about $3,000 a year to heat this house. Wow. So we've analyzed the system and we're gonna save about $2,000 a year. That's significant. It is, so they're getting heating, cooling, and domestic hot water for about $1,000 a year. Right, and the upfront cost is gonna be somewhere in between a ductless mini split and a geothermal system, somewhere in the middle? That's right. It's important to remember that compared to, let's say an air-to-air -air heat pump, the fact that this is also doing domestic water heating, it does add some cost to the system, but mm -hmm. it's a complete solution for 
all the heating and cooling needs of the house. That's one of the unique parts about it is that you're getting the three for one. You That's heating, right. Heating, cooling, and the DHW. That's right. Awesome. So. Well, where it really gets interesting is when you start to add solar into the mix or wind, right? Renewable energy that powers up the electricity that the heat pump uses. So you could effectively get to a zero cost. You could. Uh, this house has actually got roof area that could have photovoltaics on it. So the, the roof of the house could be producing the electricity that's running the heat pump year round, heating and cooling. Now, that's exciting. So, yeah. Thank you very much, John. This is so, so cool. Thanks for coming, Russ. Thanks for the tour. Thanks for watching. This old house has got a video for just about every home improvement project. So be sure to check out the others. And if you like what you see, click on the subscribe button to make sure that you get our newest videos right in your feed.